Welcome everyone, my name is Mark DeYoung, and in this video we will begin to explore the history of the alto saxophone in jazz. The world of jazz saxophone is an exciting place to explore. As a lifelong student of the music, I have found there is no better way to develop an appreciation and understanding of jazz than by examining recordings made by the myriad of inspiring instrumentalists. I'm sure you already know that there are many more alto players to listen to and to learn from than we could possibly cover in this video. So I'm going to briefly discuss several players who have left their mark on the music. These are names that everyone who plays jazz should have some familiarity with, but please remember that there are countless more worth exploring. In addition to discussing a bit about the players, I'm also going to demonstrate an excerpt of a tune associated with each player and would encourage you to put these tunes on your list of essential ones to learn. We are going to begin our exploration in the late 1920s with an alto player who began his career playing with the likes of Sidney Bechet and Chick Webb, but his biggest contribution came as a member of the Duke Ellington Orchestra, with whom he played for 42 years. Considered to be one of the first important stylists on the alto saxophone, his name was Johnny Hodges. Hodges was born in 1907 and was largely self-taught, teaching himself piano and drums before picking up the soprano saxophone in 1914 when he studied with New Orleans saxophonist Sidney Bechet. Hodges was a quick study and following several years of freelancing in Boston and New York, Hodges eventually joined Duke Ellington's newly expanded Cotton Club Band in 1928, providing him the opportunity to develop his solo playing under the guidance of the more experienced Ellington Reed man, Barney Bigard. Soon Hodges gained a reputation as an impassioned soloist who had a velvety tone, impeccable control of pitch and vibrato, and the ability to cajole sultry beauty out of each perfectly timed note. In addition to being the lead alto soloist with Ellington for over four decades, Hodges also released many recordings as a leader. One of my personal favorites is a recording called Side by Side that also features incredible solos by Ben Webster, Roy Eldridge, Harry Sweets Edison, Papa Joe Jones, Billy Strayhorn, and of course, Duke Ellington. Ellington often featured Hodges on ballads that showcased his melodic prowess, and one of his famous recordings is a beautifully haunting melody called Isfahan, composed by Billy Strayhorn and recorded on Ellington's Far East Suite. I'm going to play the second half of the melody and do my best to capture that elusive quality for which Hodges was justifiably famous. Up next, we take a look at one of the most important musicians to play jazz on any instrument, the legendary Charlie Parker. Born in 1920 in Kansas City, Parker was introduced to music in his public school music program. He started on the baritone horn and later was gifted an alto saxophone by his mother. He became so focused on learning to play that he left school to pursue music full time. Kansas City was a bustling music town even in the midst of the Great Depression, and Parker found many opportunities to jam with local and touring musicians in the various jazz and blues clubs. Before he was out of his teens, he was playing and touring with pro bands led by Buster Smith and Jay McShann, with whom he made his first professional recording in 1940. He was also greatly influenced 
by the recordings of tenor saxophonist Lester Young. Parker would memorize Young's solos note for note, emulating the rhythmic buoyancy and lyricism that were two of Young's famous hallmarks. One stage of his development which led to the future dominance on the alto was an extended stint performing in the Ozark Mountains and studying music theory with guitarist Efferge Ware. His complete mastery of the instrument came as a result of practicing between 11 and 15 hours every day. When he decided to move to New York City, he encountered other adventurous musicians exploring new ways to improvise, including Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk, Max Roach, Charlie Christian, and Bud Powell. During the years 1942 to 1945, Parker and Gillespie would be considered the forerunners of a new style of music that came to be known as bebop. After touring with bands led by Billy Eckstein and Earl Hines, Parker established himself as a leader, recording frequently along with trumpeters Gillespie and the young Miles Davis. They wrote their own original compositions and set new standards of virtuosity and rhythmic and harmonic innovation within their solos. His recorded output is an essential canon for anyone serious about learning jazz, and his recordings on Dial, Savoy, Verve, and Mercury Records have served as important documents of the development of black improvised music. His recordings of such tunes as Coco, which is based on the tune Cherokee, Now's the Time, a 12-bar blues, Moose the Mooch, which is based on I've Got Rhythm, Yardbird Suite, and many others are standards in the repertoire. In 1950, the club Birdland was opened and named in his honor, and he became renowned around the world as one of the greatest improvisers to ever grace the stage. I'm going to play an excerpt of his composition, Yardbird Suite. It's interesting to note that a club by the same name in Edmonton, Alberta, is one of Canada's longest-running jazz venues and was named in honor of this Parker composition. Here is Yardbird Suite. <laughs> 